The Altreba writes in Tanya that Tachlis Hashlemus Hazasho Yemosa Mashiach, the ultimate completeness, completion of Yemosa Mashiach, of the times of Mashiach and the revival of the dead, resurrection, Chiyas Amesim, Shahu Gilior and Sof Baruch, which is a revelation of the infinite light. You can walk past, don't worry about it. It's all good. Thank you. Um, Bo'elam Hazer, revelation of this light in this world, in this physical world. This revelation of what will happen, what will be revealed when Mashiach comes, in Yemosa Mashiach and Chiyas Amesim, will, is a result of our actions, Ma'asein of Avodaseinu, and our work calls Man Meshach HaGolos throughout the time of the Golos. Ki ha-goyrem schar ha-mitzvah, hi ha-mitzvah ba'atzma. The thing that, you can go past, thank you. The thing that causes goyrem schar ha-mitzvah, that which causes the schar, the reward of the mitzvah, is the mitzvah itself. Why? What does that mean? Ki ba'asiyosa, mam shicha adam gilu yoren sof baruchu milamayin lamata. When a person performs a mitzvah, you can go. Don't worry about it. When a person performs a mitzvah, mitzvah comes from the Aramaic word, the word in Gemara, tzavza, letzavis, means to connect. A mitzvah is a connection. By definition, the nature of a mitzvah is that it... I didn't bring anything. Sorry. It's just to keep me on track. Um, the, the nature of a mitzvah is... A mitzvah is Hashem's request, Hashem's desire. It's the rotten of Hashem. Hashem says, I want you to do this, whatever it is. Put on tefillin, and light Shabbos candles, learn Torah, etc., etc. That was three out of 613. Or oh, not really, because one was a mitzvah to Rabbonin, So it's three out of 620. Um, so these are mitzvahs. These are things Hashem has asked us to do. When we fulfill these mitzvahs, we are by definition... As a result, therefore, bringing Hashem down into the world. We are connecting mitzvah, tzavsa, letzavish, to connect. We connect with Hashem. We bring Hashem down into the world. Therefore, there's, there's an expression that says, schar mitzvah, mitzvah comes from pirkei avos. Schar mitzvah, mitzvah, schar avera, avera. The reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. What does it mean the reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah? So there are a number of different correct and accurate meanings that are presented by different mafarshim. One is that because it's a mitzvah to enjoy doing mitzvahs, when a person does a mitzvah and gets pleasure out of it, the pleasure and enjoyment, the simcha they get out of being mekayim a mitzvah, the simcha shel mitzvah, is in itself a mitzvah. So the reward you get from doing a mitzvah, which is the joy that it brings you, is itself a mitzvah. So the reward of the mitzvah is also a mitzvah. And there are a number of different things that it means. One is that when, and there's the mitzvah goreres mitzvah, when a person performs a mitzvah, it causes another mitzvah that earlier on in the same Mishnah. One of the things that, one of the explanations of what it means, schar mitzvah mitzvah, is that because the nature of a mitzvah is that it's tzavsa, it's a connection. So when a person performs a mitzvah, it connects the person to Hashem. That is the very nature of the mitzvah. So the schar of the mitzvah is the actual mitzvah itself. What it's saying here is something close, but a little different. And the words that are used by the Altarebbe here in Tanya are, Ki ha-goyrem schar ha-mitzvah hi ha-mitzvah atzmo. The thing that causes the schar of the mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. The mitzvah generates the schar. The schar is not a salary. The schar of a mitzvah is not remuneration. It's not Hashem saying, well, I asked you to do this, you did it, I'm going to give you a paycheck. That's what remuneration is. Remuneration is when someone pays a person for doing something for them. Here, the mitzvah actually generates the schar. Right? When a person lays bricks, you put bricks, you put cement, you put more bricks, you build a house. Someone didn't give you the house as a reward for building it. You built the house, you have a house cause and effect. You take action and there's an outcome. You mix ingredients in a bowl, you put them in the oven and you get a baked product. It's not a reward. The oven's not rewarding you for following the recipe correctly or you're such a good person, you follow the recipe, I'm going to give you a nice cake. It's a cause and effect. It's the goyrim. You put the ingredients together, you do a good job, you put it in the oven at the right temperature, you get a good quality baked product. When we are Mekaya Mitzvahs, because mitzvahs at tzavsa, they are a connection. They are a connection to Hashem. Every time we fulfill a mitzvah, we are generating 
the time of Mashiach, Yemosa Mashiach. Yemosa Mashiach is a natural outcome. You can walk past if you want. Yemosa Mashiach, La'asid Lavoi, the time of Mashiach is a natural outcome of following mitzvahs, of fulfilling mitzvahs, of performing mitzvahs, of learning Torah, of doing all these things that the Torah tells us to do. It's not ju- it is a reward, but it's not reward in the form of remuneration. It's not payment. It's a reward that's actually generated by the performance of the mitzvahs. And this is something we see in a number of different contexts. We see the same thing in Gan Eden. The Gemara talks about Gan Eden, describes what happens in Gan Eden. Tzadikim yoshvim, v'atoraseim b'rosheim, v'nenim ezivashchina. The tzadikim sit and they bask and enjoy the extreme pleasure of being in the presence of Hashem's complete glory. That's the ultimate greatest reward a person could ever ask for. Halavai, we should all relate to that, and that should be the greatest thing that we all aspire to have. And I shouldn't say halavai, I can only say halavai and myself, not anyone else here. I don't want to be chesh at anybody else. But it's a natural outcome why tzaddikim spend their life learning Torah, being Mekaya mitzvahs, that's why the Gemara says, Ashrei Misha Bala Kanva Biyodoi. Fortunate is someone who comes here with his Talmud, with his Limurator in his hand. Why? It's not just that he comes and he's going to show a receipt and say, Hey, look, I did this, I learned Torah, I did mitzvahs. Here, I get to have my reward. It's not just that. You can walk past, don't worry about it. Thank you. Yeah. Plenty of people walk past already. But if it's going to make coming to Shul more enjoyable next time, go for it. Um, so, why is a person fortunate if they come, the person, their life has concluded, they come up to Shemaim, they come up to heaven, and it's time to receive the outcome of the life they lived, whatever it's going to be. They come, they have their Torah study in their hand, they have their good deeds in their hand, they're fortunate. Why? Because that puts them in a position to be able to naturally experience the revelation of Hashem's glory. Hashem's glory is a natural event. Where there is God, there is God's glory. Where there is Hashem, where there is Ein Sof, where there is the infinite one, there is Or Ein Sof. There is the radiance of the infinite one. It's a natural effect. If there's a light bulb and there's current running through it, there's going to be light coming out of it. The question is, when a person gets there, are they in a position to be able to experience what is actually present. Hashem's radiance, the Ziv Hashchina, is present. When a person lived a life of being Mekayim Torah, of learning Torah and, and fulfilling mitzvahs, that dresses up, these are what are called Levushim, these are the Levushim, the garments of the soul. A person who comes there dressed up for the occasion, a person has all the appropriate accessories that then enable them to be able to experience the natural event which is happening, which is Hashem's glory. So the, the tzaddikim experiencing nehnim mizibashchina, getting pleasure from the radiance of Hashem's glory in Gan Eden is a natural outcome of living the life of a tzaddik, of spending our lives here doing what we're supposed to be doing. And it's the same thing in La'asid Lavo. Why? Ki ha-goyrem schar ha-mitzvah, hi ha-mitzvah atzma. The thing that causes what is going to happen, and that's why the ultimate completeness of Yemosa Mashiach, which will be a revelation of Hashem's infinite light, in this world, it's dependent on our actions, not because Hashem's sitting and doing the checks and balances, and once, once if we do what we're supposed to, then Hashem will give us the reward. It's because we are actually generating this situation. Every mitzvah that's performed is a tzavsa. It's a connection. It brings Hashem's presence into the world. It makes the world naturally a godly place. It brings Oren Sof into the world. The more that that happens, the more of Hashem's infinite light, this presence, Oren Sof is present in the world, the closer the world comes to being at a point where it naturally gets to a state of from here, from here, it's about the world, it's not about the personal people. Like Correct. Yes, exactly. So the, the, the fact that it's cause and effect is the same, it's just a different scenario. One is, is personal gain and one is 
for the greater good of the universe, which happens to bring yeah, personal gain as well. Which happens to be the ultimate reward as well, even a greater reward than Ganadin, which we'll get to a bit more specifically. So keeping that in mind, I want to ask a question now. We are all sent into this world. Oh, let's back up a step. We all say Shema. Everyone is halachically obligated to say Shema at least twice a day. Certainly every man. Yes, that's why we have reminders sent out to people to remind them to say Shema on time. Thank you, Abba, for helping people fulfill their mitzvahs. Text, send a text or WhatsApp to Abba and he'll text you before Sof Shema Krishna in the morning. Or just a text. So, we read Shema twice a day. What does it say? You shall love Hashem your God with all your heart. Levav v'cha with two bases. Why doesn't it say b'chol libcha, which is the normal, regular word for heart? Why are there two bases? Levav v'cha. It's an unusual form of the word. It's grammatically correct, but it's an unusual form. So the Mishnah says, b'shnei yotzerecha. There are two bases to teach us that we have to serve Hashem with both of our inclinations. Our yetzer tov, our positive inclination, and our yetzer hara, our negative inclination. Now, to do that for real, for each of us to actually not just serve Hashem, to love Hashem, but if, if the nature of an evil, of my evil inclination is by definition negative, it's a negative inclination, it's a yetzer hara, negative inclination, how can that love Hashem? Hashem is positive. This is naturally inclined to negative. And so this is what Chassidus discusses at length. Back up one posuk. Shema Yisrael Hashem Lekein Hashem Echad. Here, Yisrael, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. Think about that. Think about the, the infinite greatness. Think about the oneness of Hashem, etc., etc. And then, va'ahavta can be translated correctly two different ways. The Hebrew word va'ahavta means, and you shall love. It's an instruction, a directive. It also means va'ahavta, and you will love. It's a statement of fact. Shema Yisrael, if we think, we contemplate, we focus, we get involved in understanding and then connecting to the, and becoming aware of, in a, in a very deep and personal, real way, the greatness and oneness of Hashem, then we will love Hashem with both of our hearts, both of our souls. What does that mean? We have, each of us has a godly soul. It's that part of us that is naturally inclined to reach upward to become closer to God, which is its source, where it comes from. And we have the Nefesh Abahamis, the animal soul. The animal soul is the soul that makes us be living human animals to an extent, for all intents and purposes. Even though there's Minha Chay and Minha Madaba, and humans are not technically what we would call part of the equivalent of the animal kingdom in terms of Torah discussion. But to an extent, it's called the Nefesh Abahamis because we are, in a way, human animals. We're living beings. We're alive. We have natural inclinations and tendencies like all animals do. And the Nefesh Abahamis is just that. It's the soul that makes us be a living human animal. How do we get that to love God and to want to, to prefer learning Torah, doing mitzvahs, connecting to the Creator rather than having ice cream and a nice car? Shema Yisrael. If we listen, we hear, we connect, we explain to ourselves as human beings, we get to the point where not only does our godly soul appreciate this, but who we are as a human being appreciates it, then we will love it with both of our souls. Our self as a, just a human being will start to appreciate the true value of that which is absolute good, not subjective or relative good, a.k.a. the Creator, God, Torah, Mitzvah, Hashem. We start to love Hashem with both of our souls. But why is it so important? Why is it so important that we have to love Hashem with both of our souls? Who cares? Why can't it be enough for us to spend our lives, we have a never shelly kiss, we have a godly soul, let's focus on making sure that our godly soul overpowers our animal soul. And we always do the right thing because despite the fact that we're human and we have negative inclinations and we have a Yetzirah and a Nefesh Abahamis, we make sure that our positive, God, positive inclination, godly soul, is the final word and makes sure that it always overpowers the nev- negative inclination, the animal soul, the animalistic tendencies that we have. Why is that not enough? Why do we need to transform the Nefesh Abahamis, the Yetzirah, so that we love Hashem with both of our inclinations?
So I want to go back to, to get to the answer to this question, and it's going to tie back into what we opened up with very strongly, and it's going to actually be quite fascinating to break down the words of the Alter Rebbe and get a little more in detail and nitpick specifically what the Alter Rebbe is saying there. We, we know that there's a statement, there are various versions of this statement in Gemara, in Rambam, different places, Rishonim, all over the place, different people have different versions. Rambam says, On Ruchachamim, the sages say, Makam Shabale Tshuva Omdin, the places where people who are Bale Tshuva, people who have previously lived lives that were not in line with the directives of Torah, and they changed and returned and came back to live a life in line with who they tr- truly are, with their godly soul, with the directives of Torah. The place that they stand in ain't tzaddikim gemurim yechulim lamid boy. Tzaddikim gemurim, people who are completely, perfectly righteous, never did anything wrong in their entire life, they are not able to reach the places that Bale Tshuva reach. Pretty extreme statement. We're not just talking about regular good people who didn't veer off the path and come back. It says tzaddikim gemurim, people who are perfectly righteous, never did anything wrong, have a 100% clean slate, Perfect, impeccable. And they are not in a place where a Balchuv is. Now, there are a couple of reasons why this is the case. One is a tzaddik always does the right thing. A tzaddik is always in a good place. A Balchuvah, someone who has veered from the past, someone who has been involved in things that are negative, things that are not suggested. Pro, they are prohibited by Torah. And, and, and this can go very extreme. It could be a person who lived their entire life against Torah and opposed Torah deliberately and did everything in the book incorrectly, did everything wrong according to Torah. They turn around and come back. That's something very interesting about such a person that stays in the Gemara. That a person, Hamakadish, if someone betroths a lady and says, you are betrothed to me on the condition that I am a tzaddik gomer, that I am perfectly righteous, and this is someone that we all know is as far as can be from perfectly righteous, we have to treat that as a valid betrothal. Why? Shema hir her truva beliboy. All he has to do is to have had, it has to have been a true and honest thought, but all he has to have done is had a thought of return, a thought of repentance, thought, you know what? It's wrong. I regret it. I'm going to head back and live a life the way that I should be living. In that instant, a person can literally transform from being at the complete bottom end of the spectrum, doing everything wrong deliberately, and become perfectly righteous instantaneously. Why? Because the fact is that the godly soul that we have, the neshama, it is a chelek elokamimal. It is a part of the creator. And that doesn't change. What changes is the things that surround it. The actions of the body that this soul is inside of are negative. And there are very significant negative ramifications. It will have a negative impact on the connection between the soul and the body and many other things. But it doesn't change the nature of the godly soul. It doesn't change the nature of the nefesh elikis. And because that nefesh elikis is always a part of God and will always be a part of God no matter what, it's able to return in an instant. It can never be separated from the Creator. No matter what, it's impossible. And this is something that is demonstrated specifically by Abal Tshuva. This is something that is very special about the neshama, the, 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 the extent to which it's connected to Hashem, to the Creator, that it cannot be severed no matter what. That is only something that's demonstrated and expressed by Bali Tshuva, because a tzaddik lives in a perfect life, has an impeccable record, which is an amazing thing, and that's the way it's supposed to be. But there's a certain element of the Shoma that never gets expressed, because this Tshuva never happens. But, this is something that a Baal Tshuva does, that a tzaddik never does, but, it's not really such a big advantage if you think about it, because the tzaddik's, Neshama, the tzaddik's godly soul, is equally as connected to Hashem as the Baal Tshuva's soul is. It's just that the Baal Tshuva, the person who did wrong and came back, 
demonstrated it, exemplified it. But the tzaddik's neshama is equally as connected and the tzaddik also could be able to do that. It's just that he didn't. So in terms of this advantage of a Baal Tshuva over a tzaddik, of a person who's repentant over a person who was always perfect, it's really just kind of a relative or subjective advantage. It's not a real true advantage. There's no advantage as far as that's concerned in the soul, in the neshama of a Baal Tshuva over the neshama of a tzaddik. But there is something that's very different. That's not just a matter of perspective or revelation. Something that the journey of a Baal Tshuva actually achieves that the journey of a tzaddik does not achieve. And that is that a Baal Tshuva can, when a person re- returns, comes back from having done wrong things, they can actually take things that are negative and make them positive. And a tzaddik cannot do that. A tzaddik follows the rules, means that they don't get involved with negative things. Which means that they do an extreme amount of positive work and do good things. But there's a whole element of creation of existence that they're not able to uplift because they're not allowed to go there. They're not allowed to be involved. When a person is involved with those things and then they turn their life around and they get to a point where their passion for Torah and mitzvahs is greater than that of a tzaddik because of where they're coming from, that now means that the negative things that they were involved in actually are responsible for the fact that they are in a place that a tzaddik can't even be, which means that those negative things now became positive. So, at, at, and, and this is something that's novel. This is something that a, that a Russia, that a Baal Tshuva, a person who was in a negative place, turned around and came back, can actually achieve an outcome that a tzaddik cannot achieve, will actually make a change in the world that a tzaddik cannot make. The same thing is true in terms of a discussion back to Pirkei Avos. Again, Pirkei Avos says that al chai, al you, against your will are you born, against you, your will do you pass away. That's what the Mishnah says. What does it mean against your will you are born? It means that the Neshama, before a person is born, each of us has a body and a soul. Sorry, if you don't mind, can I just ask you to sit here? Sure. I was just asked to record it, so. Um, so, before a person is born, each of us is a body and a soul, a guf and a nefesh. The Neshama is lamaila, and it's basking in the glory of Hashem. It's basking in the infinite glory of the Creator. Why would it want to come down here? And it doesn't want to come down here. And the time comes for a child to be born, and Hashem says, you go in that body, and it doesn't want to go. That's why the Mishnah says, against your will do you live? Because the soul doesn't want to come down here. Then the Mishnah also says, against your will, against the person's will, does a person pass away? Now, obviously, the simple meaning is that most people don't want to pass away. They want to stay alive. But in the context of the way that we explained, against your will you were born, it's the same thing. Because once the soul comes into this world, comes into a body and sees that it can actually achieve things that cannot be achieved by a soul on its own above when it's basking in the glory of, of Hashem's radiance, of the Urain Sof, of the infinite light. It doesn't want to go. It wants to stay here because here it can achieve things that can't be achieved above. Why would it want to go? Why would it want to leave? So this is true both of an Ashama when it comes down and, and of a Baal Tshuva Versus a tzaddik. When a soul comes down into this world, it can actually be involved in bringing God into the world. Yes, a soul above, a neshama before it comes down into a body can bask in the glory of Hashem's radiance, but it can't actually achieve anything. Can't generate any positive outcomes. Can't change the world. Comes here. Every mitzvah literally changes the world. Every mitzvah brings God into the world more and more. So these are novelties. Here, we see that things are actually being generated. Things are being changed. A Baal Tshuva actually causes a change that a tzaddik doesn't cause. And a shama, a soul in a body can cause things in the world, outcomes that a soul can't cause above. And it's these things that we generate, these causes, these or the, the outcomes that result from or that are generated by our actions that can only be generated by, by actions of a soul in a body, of an ashama in a guf. These are the things that cause what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. Tachlis hashlemus hazeshel, yimosim Mashiach hutchiyas hameisim. Now, we talked a couple of weeks ago about how la'asid lavoi, what is really yimosim Mashiach about? It's about 
As Rambam says, as Novi says, Molaha Aretz Day Yes Hashem. Why do we want Yemos Mashiach? We want Yemos Mashiach because we will see the absolute truth. The actual truth now is that God is everywhere. There's divine creative force behind everything that exists. Koyach Hapoyel Bahanifal that makes it exist. We don't see it. When Hashem, when Mashiach comes in Yemos Mashiach, we'll see the truth for what it is. We will see Hashem everywhere. We will see Hashem in everything. But, and, and in terms of, of words of, of Kabbalah, words of Chassidus. We know that there's a discussion of, there's something that is one of the most fundamental concepts that's discussed in Kabbalah and Chassidus, Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum is contraction. You had Hashem before the world was created. All we had was Hashem. Hashem himself and the Orein Sof, the infinite light, Hashem's radiance, the natural outcome of Hashem existing. But in the presence of Hashem's radiance, you can't have things that exist independently of Hashem or at least apparently independently, things that have a sense of independent significance. You can't have worlds, you can't have perspectives, you can't have perceptions, you can't have anything really. You can have everything, but it won't have a sense of independence the way that we do. So if, if for that to happen, Hashem contracted, since then, Hashem contracted this Oren Sof, this infinite radiance. Now, it didn't go away, it just became concealed. It exists, it's present right here, right now, but we're not aware of it. What will happen in Yemosa Mashiach is that the Oren Sof Milifnei Hatzimtzum, this radiance that exists before this pre-contraction, the natural state of Hashem's radiance will once again be restored. It will be in place. The question is, does that sound like a good investment? Hashem was present. We had the Oren Sof that was revealed in full glory. Hashem took it away. Why? So that worlds could exist. So we could bring Hashem into this world. And so that Hashem's presence could be revealed once again. Sounds like a whole lot of work and just to get back to where you started. right? If you would ask any person to invest in a business that you're going to run like that, no one's going to give you a penny. Now, that's not true. I've taken it a little bit out of context because there is something here that's novel. Because before... There was either a revelation of Hashem's presence or there was the ability for the worlds for us to exist in the absence of the perception of Hashem's presence. That's what symptom is. It's a pseudo lack of Hashem's presence, an apparent lack of Hashem's presence, even though Hashem's presence is here. But for us to have a sense of independent significance, we have to not be aware of it. When in Yomosa Mashiach, when Mashiach comes, we will be able to exist and be aware of it at the same time, which is novel. And it will, Hashem's presence will then be part of the world, which is what we discussed in detail a couple of weeks ago, which is novel. But how novel is it? What, what's interesting and what happens beyond that further, and the, the Gemara says, Am Rabchia Bar Abba. All the Nevim, all the prophets, the prophecies we have about the, the times of Mashiach, the days of Mashiach, that's what they refer to, the days of Mashiach. Mashiach. The world to come. No eye has seen Elikim Zolosecha aside from God himself. No one knows what that is. There's no prophecies about Olam Abba. What exactly the world to come means is a matter of contention, but the accepted consensus, at least for sure according to Kabbalah and Chassidus, and it's the majority opinion according to the Poskim and Nigla also, is that it refers to a further stage of Mashiach, which is the ultimate state of reward, which will be in this physical world. It will be us as living human beings with souls and bodies, but but experiencing something, not just that which was there before the Tzimtzum, something which never existed outside of Hashem himself ever, since not the dawn of time, since before time even existed. Before time was created, before the Tzimtzum, there was Oren Sof, there was the radiance of Hashem, Hashem's natural radiance, but there wasn't Hashem himself. There were parts of Hashem which did not radiate. They were too much a part of Hashem himself that they didn't radiate. Now, when you have a light bulb, there are things, light radiates from a light bulb, it's a natural occurrence, but I don't, what, what's reflecting off the table into my eyes is not the light bulb, it's the light that's coming from the light bulb. When the, further on, when Mashiach comes, we will experience things which never were revealed. They weren't even part of the Orient. So if they weren't part of the radiance, they didn't radiate. They were part of Hashem himself. And that's going to be, that's going to be Olam Haba. 
which Ayin Loi Rasa, it has never been seen. Even before the symptom, it wasn't seen because it wasn't revealed it was part of Hashem himself. Now let's go back to, oh, so getting back to, okay, so let's go back to what the Alter Rebbe says. Tachlis Hashem Mosazesh or Yemoysa Mashiach, this completeness of Yemoysa Mashiach, or Tchias HaMesim, the days of Mashiach, and Tchias HaMesim, two things, because Rambam describes Yemoysa Mashiach and says that Yemoysa Mashiach is just the natural order of the world couple of things that change within the within the framework of the natural world, nothing out of the ordinary. Then there's Yemoisa Mashiach. These two things are caused by Tolu, they are dependent on Ma'asenu, our actions, Va'avoidosenu, and our work. There's actions, there's the things we do, and then there's the things we do which are work. Work means we push the boundaries, we push the limits, we do things that are difficult, we go beyond ourselves, we do things that are novel, they're not just part and parcel of our life as an obedient, observant, whatever you want to call it, Jew. It's avoda, it's work. When we go out of the framework of ourselves as people and as observant Jews, and we work to do something new, to generate something that's novel, the outcome is also novel. The outcome of doing the right thing, status quo, doing the things we're supposed to do as per the system, is the Yemosa Mashiach, the completeness within the system. The outcome of doing Avoda, of working, of pushing the limits, of not just loving Hashem with our godly soul, but transforming the animal soul into something that it isn't naturally. It's a job, it's work, and it's a novelty. When we do something that's a novelty, we achieve something that's novel, which the Baal Tshuva achieves that the Tzaddik doesn't, which the Neshama, the soul, achieves when it comes down into a body which it can't achieve above. When we achieve something that's novel by pushing the boundaries and doing avoda, that brings to Tchiyas Amesim. Tchiyas Amesim, revival of the dead, is not natural. It's not at all a part of the natural order of things. And the Alter Rebbe says there are two things. Yemoysa Mashiach, Tchiyas Amesim. They are dependent on Ma'aseinu for Avoida Seinu, respectively. Yemoysa Mashiach, Tchiyas Amesim are an outcome of our actions and our work. And that's why, and this really keeping this in mind should be a driving force and help to keep us motivated and to keep pushing and to work and to not get down when we face challenges and when things are difficult and we really need to push the boundaries. Because when we push the boundaries, we are doing something that's novel. When we do something that's novel, it changes from just generating Yemos HaMashiach which, as Ramam says, is Olam Kimin Hagonog, the world continues to exist as part of the natural order. And it brings us to Tchiyas Amesim, which is the Olam Haba, the world to come, which is Ayin Lo Rasa Lekim That no eye has seen, no prophet has prophesied about it. It hasn't even been seen before the symptom because it never existed. It's, these are things that come not from Hashem's natural radiance, but from Hashem Himself. And, but as Hashem, we should continue to enjoy and be passionate about our work and serving Hashem and pushing the boundaries to do the right things and to, we should be zoicha to see the, not just remuneration, but the natural outcome of that.